a good morning to be together. Good morning. What a joy. All of us here together. I know there are more that uh, could be here. Some are home feeling poorly. Some were feeling poorly and are, are back. Uh, so we will take God's blessing as it is and thank him as the word tells us in all things and be thankful that we're here together uh, as family. Let him use you. <clears throat> Let him use you this morning. You are here for a purpose. James very nicely uh, explained some, a lot of our unity and a lot of our connectedness. But, but be here as a tool of God. The same way you would go out tomorrow morning to your work or to serve your family, uh, to, to be that uh, useful tool in the hand of God, let him do that with you now. So that as we get together, uh, your relationships can, can build, that you can be a person of, uh, uh, of connectivity, of encouragement with one another. That your prayer before you leave the house in the morning is that God will use you and show you opportunity to build up this body. Uh, there are a lot of uh, good things going on, and we need a lot of strength uh, from the Lord to keep them going. Let's go to our Father in prayer before we begin the lesson. Heavenly Father, dear Lord, we thank you more than we can say for what you've done for us. Father, we pray that uh, your word can be uh, known to us and by us, that we can be obedient to it. Father, help us to uh, be a family that studies uh, the scriptures that you've given to us. What a privilege we have that in all of our homes we can have multiple copies of your word, uh, that we can have it electronically as we go throughout the day, that we can uh, read it and, and listen to it, uh, and yet uh, so often we leave it uh, idle. Father, help us to be uh, diligent in, in, uh, in study and diligent in our relationships. Uh, help us to be active in, in connecting with one another and encouraging one another to look for those who are hurting uh, and lonely and struggling. Father, help us to reach out uh, to this community in any place you give us uh, that we can spread your gospel uh, with our lives, with our lives, with our words, uh, and uh, as a church body working together in every opportunity you give us. Uh, thank you for... Uh, this time we pray that we get out of your word that which you want. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We just read in James chapter 1 that, that we should hum in, in humility receive the word. In humility, receive the word, verse 21. We talk a lot about humility around here, and we try to, to, uh, to make that a practical point for us. But look what this says about the word. In humility, receive the word implanted inside of us. That the word isn't something that we just know about. The word is something that we have inside of us which is able to save your souls. Do you think that's enough that we could make a doctrine out of that? That if, if you just got and memorized and knew the word of God really well, that that would result in your salvation? That's what it says. Receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 that you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Luke 1.77, To give to his people the knowledge of salvation. You know, if you kept going with that, and you could make a doctrine out of knowing the word results in salvation. 
And you would correctly challenge that idea to say, wait, 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 wait. It's not just knowledge. It's not just an implanting of the word. It's, it's got to be active. You've got to do something about it. Well, I can take these scriptures out of context just as good as the next guy. Years ago, I, I, I had a really good lesson on taking scriptures out of context. I mean a really good lesson, a really, really, really good lesson, and I never even met the man, have no idea who it was. Late at night, late, late at night, after midnight, I'm driving down some highway down south, uh, southeast United States, uh, Georgia, Alabama, wherever I'm driving. And I, at, the, at of this date, I don't remember if it was a trip that the military put me on or I was going to some other church get-together because uh, we were pretty uh, active when we were young. And I don't remember if it was before or after I was married. Sorry, Carol. But I remember this. <laughs> I, I stay awake uh, and, and did. I, I, I pull off the side of the road and take a nap now. But when I was a young buck, I'd just ke keep going late at night and drive and drive and drive. And so I'd get some talk radio going, some, some guy talking about aliens or whatever and get me really irritated or confused. Well, this was a preacher. I got a preacher on, on and he was going on. And his point was that we could know exactly when Jesus was coming. We could know exactly when Jesus was coming, and I thought, okay, this guy's got my interest. I want to hear what he's going to say here. You could know exactly when Jesus was coming. And his, and his key verse in his, in his explanation came, comes from Revelation 3.3. 3. I will come like a thief. I will come like a thief. And you think that's pretty clear. Thieves come when you don't expect it. In fact, the Bible says that, you know, but his point, and, and let me tell you, it was just, it was just unbelievable in its, in its audacity. He said, we don't understand this verse because we didn't live in the first century. I tell you what, if we had lived back then, we'd known exactly what he was talking about when he said he came like a thief. He said it several times. He said it in the gospels and he said it to, to in Revelation. And, and he went on, and he said, coming like a thief means that you get you're riding over the hills on your horses and on your camels. Thieves didn't come in individuals. They came in great groups back then, and, and they would ride across the, the sand dunes and over the hills, and they would kick up dust. And, you, and the town could see that the thieves were coming days ahead of time. And he went on and on and on on. Never mind that Revelation, the very second, next half of the sentence says, you will not know when I will come to you. You will not know at what hour I will come to you. See, you can take scriptures out of context and, and come up with all kinds of odd and ridiculous conclusions, and we do we being humans, often because we want to prove our point or we want to defend our, our faith or our, our faith, not the faith. We want to come to a, con a doctrinal conclusion. And what I was just reading about the word are all scriptures on salvation. That the implanted word is able to save your soul. That's scripture. I didn't make that up. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Now I make known to you, brother, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you stand, by which you are saved. The gospel saves you. And to me, that's the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We're, we're, we're shading ourselves, going from mere words now to words that describe actions. And then it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. You see, you can make some odd conclusions out of Scripture if you take them out of context. You could create an entire doctrine that knowing the word saves you and dig up some more conclusions about the magnificence of God's word right out of scripture and go on and on and on and on. All you have to do is ignore a few hundred scriptures, bend a few hundred more, 
and you could come up with a conclusion, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you know the Bible. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you know the Bible. You know, some other oddities, and you could even mix this one in. Um, in Acts 11, uh, it was told that Peter, verse 14, he will speak, who is called Peter was brought here, and he will speak words to you by which you will be saved. Imagine that, that, that Peter's words can save you. If you were just there to hear Peter talk, you could be saved by his words. Is that a reasonable conclusion to make from this? Paul says, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen so that they may obtain the salvation. So is it Paul's endurance that brings us salvation? I cut the sentence in half because it says salvation, which is in Jesus Christ. In fact, through Jesus is a, is a common point of salvation. Jesus says, anyone who enters through me will be saved, or he will be saved, when he describes himself as the door in John 10. He says, I'm the door. Jesus uh, tells us that, uh, or and I'm sorry, we're told in Scripture that by no other name than Jesus' name will we be saved, Acts 4.12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among, among, among men by which we must be saved. So does the name of Jesus save us? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So it's not just the name of Jesus, it's the calling on the name of Jesus. You know, it's interesting that every one of these is highlighted and, and emphasized by different groups um, follow, uh, saying they're following Christ in coming to conclusions uh, about salvation. And what we need to do is be people of the word who understand what the word teaches us. Romans 5, 8, or Romans 5, 9 says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved. The blood of Christ saves us. Well, wait a second, we're bringing something new into this. I thought the gospel saved us. Didn't the word save us a minute ago? The name of Christ saves us. We're saved in Christ, and now the blood saves us. The next verse adds something else. If for, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through, through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So now the life of Jesus saves us. The, the blood of Jesus saves us and the life of Jesus saves us. What we need to be able to do is, is take the scriptures and trust the scriptures for what it says, where it says it, and how it says it. When you read a, a piece of scripture, remember to read all of the scripture around it so you can understand context. In fact, a, a powerful way to study scripture when you're studying the detail of the words is to go back and read the whole letter or read the whole book or read that whole segment because all sorts of things become clear as to his point rather than just pulling out little pieces of scripture. So now we've got the blood of Christ saves us. We've got the life of Christ saves us. We've got the gospel that saves us. We've got the word that saves us. We haven't even gotten to some of the big ones yet. We haven't even gotten to some of the, the Christ himself, I guess. But, but uh, God's power, God and his power saves us. In 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.8. Join, me in, join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works. Not according to our works. 
A little while ago, we were talking about uh, us uh, being saved by the word, and we noted that maybe we're missing something in just saying we're saved by the word. In fact, we've got to be active about the word. We've got to be obedient in the word. Look at Hebrews chapter 5. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, please. There's a, there's a, uh, a powerful uh, caution given uh, around churches and, um, and amongst uh, different teachers and groups that want to make sure that we don't think works saves us. That we don't get mistaken to think that our works save us. And in fact, we're cautioned not to be legalistic or works-oriented in several places in Scripture. But look at this, look at this verse. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 5. We'll start in verse 8. For he was a son. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. Really? Yes, really. So we've got the word, we've got Christ himself, we've got the gospel, we've got the blood of Christ, we've got the life of Christ, we've got God uh, I, I skipped over the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit saves us. And now we've got our obedience that brings us salvation. All those who obey him. I think we need to ask uh, the, the scriptures to make up its mind. That, that maybe we should put salvation all in one chapter, in one book, in the New Testament and have it explain the whole thing. Well, it did make up its mind. And the Bible is clear about it. So when somebody says to you, you don't need to be baptized, all you need to do is, and they give you something else, look back to them and say, well, what you're saying is part of it. But the Bible talks about many things being involved in our salvation. What keeps you alive? What keeps you alive? I mean, how long ago was it that you were, when, when you last decided you'd hold your breath, see how long you'd hold your breath? Some of you have done it with your kids not too long ago when you were sitting in the living room. 30 seconds. If you stop breathing, you're not going to live. So air keeps you alive, right? Breath keeps you alive. Try to living without water. You're not going to make it very far. Water keeps you alive. Well, I thought breath kept you alive. Well, yeah, but you've got to have water too. So just water and breath. Well, no, not just water and breath. You need food. Oh, you've got to have something else that keeps you alive. Yeah, water, breath, and food. Is that enough? Well, no, that's not enough. You ought to keep your blood inside your body. I, we were talking about injuries today, um, and I was telling my children that if, uh, if, if somebody was not breathing or was bleeding out of control, that those were immediate, required immediate actions. Those were immediate 911 calls. Get some help. You've got to do something right now. So you've got to keep your blood inside your body, breathe, take in water. Is that enough? Well, no, that's not enough because you've got all kinds of other things that keep you working. The electrochemical uh, reactions that get your brain and your nerve functions moving. And that's just on the physical part. Who really keeps you alive? Who breathed into you the first time and gave you life in your body? Your Heavenly Father. And that's just physical life. We've got an entire spiritual life that we're talking about. You see, salvation is like that. You're not going to find one thing that keeps you alive. You could eat lots of food, 
and have it be terrible junk or poisonous, and you're not going to live then either. So you've got to have the right category of food. James chapter 2 gives us a, a caution about having, about isolating something. James chapter 2 warns us about isolating something, about taking one thing and blowing it out of proportion. James 2 warns us about taking one thing and blowing it out of proportion. What use is it, my brethren, verse 14, if someone says he has faith but has no works, can that faith save him? And then he goes on, a brother or sister without clothing in need of daily food, one says to him, go in peace and be warm and filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead. Faith alone, like any of these other things, alone misses the, the picture that God is giving us in Scripture. Faith alone is dead. We have to be careful that we don't pick favorite verses on any subject, really. Uh, I shouldn't say it that way. You know what I mean. We don't pick verses that we uh, manipulate into being more than they are without, without recognizing the other verses because we all have favorite verses and we all are motivated by to many good things by, by uh, highlighting uh, pieces of Scripture. 1 Peter 3, verse 21 says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you took baptism now saves you out of context, I'd, uh, identify those Greek words correctly and says immersion saves you and just started immersing people. Let's all go down to the lake. Let's catch people at the swimming pool. You can help them out the other end of the pool and say you are now saved. Just pull them out. You're now saved. They have, have everybody jump in one pool, pull them out the other end. And they said, what? You're saved. Saved from what? Uh, you're, uh, 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 I didn't know I was doing, I, was, I went swimming. What are you talking about? No, no, no. You've been immersed. You're now saved. You see how ridiculous it is to take scriptures out of context and try to make bigger points with them. All of these are integral in our salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the word, the gospel, we said that before, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge to inheritance in the view of the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. In one sentence, we have Christ, the Word, the Gospel, God, the Holy Spirit, our faith, all coming together in one description to restore our relationship with God. That's just one example. Uh, Galatians 3, 24. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For all are one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants. One of the scriptures I I uh, skipped over for this, I uh, have in my notes here, says that all Israel will be saved. Does that mean you have to be a part of Israel to be saved? Well, spiritually, yes. And in Christ, you become Abraham's descendants, heirs of the promise of God to Abraham. Come to us in Christ. Is it separate from the rest? No. 
It's all part of it. It all fits together. Our faith, our obedience, our uh, connection to Christ, our sealing by the Holy Spirit, the power of the living God, the blood of Christ, the life of Christ, the words of Christ, the gospel itself, uh, our baptism into Christ, all of it works together for our salvation. Be careful in, in hearing and, and, in, and in teaching others about this. Let them know that the whole word works together. And it's, it's not complicated. It's not hard to follow. You can look at it simply as the first group uh, stood before Peter and they were cut to the heart and said, what must, we, what must we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not complicated, but we can't be guilty. We have to be careful not to be guilty of isolating scriptures and manipulating our doctrine to match what we wanted to teach or anybody else matching it what they what they wanted to teach by the way you can look through justification and redemption and salvation and saved and saves and you'll never find an interesting word connected to them you will never find prayer as a connection to salvation nobody ever prays to come to Christ in the in the New Testament no prayer ever brought somebody or connected somebody or had a part of somebody's salvation. They, they came uh, by faith in Christ and obedience to Christ, by looking and listening to his word, by, by participating in the gospel, by the power of God and sealed by the Holy Spirit. If any this morning are ready for that step, if any have any other needs that they need to make known to the, to the body here, please let us know what those needs are and and we'll do our best to help you with them while we stand and sing the song that has been selected.